<laughs> Let's go get them. <laughs> totally awesome. Totally awesome. Well, I want to welcome you uh, again to, to church this morning and God's people and God's house and singing God's praises. And now we're going to study God's word. And so I think that was a really good choice on your behalf. I'm glad that that you're here. Uh, I want to ask you to please uh, do me a favor and open up your Bible to 1 Samuel chapter 3. 1 Samuel chapter 3, not a book of the Bible that's, that's studied uh, too often, but it's really good. And uh, we've been gleaning from it a little bit, and we're going to glean in, into it and lean into it really, really deeply this morning. Uh, while you're turning there, I want to remind you that this new series, uh, God's Unheroes, is kind of wedged in the middle of our study of the book of Acts. And in the book of Acts is, is really, um, really a high bar. And, and, and we see this like incredible call from God to his people and how to respond properly to Jesus Christ's mandate to be his witnesses to the ends of the earth and to make disciples of all people. And a lot of times we look at that and we're, we see the, pro, the appropriate response and we're like, how in the world can I do that, right? We kind of feel a little small. And so we, we spent the last three weeks in this series trying to reconcile these two things. Uh, the first one is the magnitude of the task at hand, to reach all the peoples on the earth with the gospel of Jesus Christ, to enlarge, to grow the kingdom of God. I heard, I think it was Carl that you told me this uh, just yesterday when we were here for 6 o'clock in the morning prayer. He said that God is looking for hearts where he could reign, like those little kingdom spots. Like, can, he, can the kingdom exist here and here? Maybe not in this person, maybe not in this area, but maybe it can exist here. And that's what God is really looking here for. And so we see that there's this massive job to do. And, and so we recognize the magnitude of the job, and that's kind of frightening. And what we try to do is reconcile this massive task with this awareness of our smallness. We recognize not only is the task so big, but yet I am so small. And I think Moses of old said it best when God said, Hey, I want you to go to the most powerful man on the planet who could kill you, and I want you to tell him to let my people go. And Moses says it best, and we could all say that when we study the book of Acts, and we realize the size of the job, and we realize who we are, we could be like the Moses of old and go, Who am I? Who am I to do this? Little old me. He says it best, and we could all say that. And so we spent the last three weeks doing this. We've been studying. We studied Moses. We looked at his story. And, and he was a fugitive and a felon and a, and a shepherd out in the desert for 40 years, and God called him. And then we studied Rahab. We don't have to say much about her. She's a prostitute. And we, and we studied Gideon, the, this small, insignificant man from a, from a nation and a family of nobodies that never accomplished anything and were always losing. But we see these individuals and they've been used mightily for the Lord. The unlikely, the unprepared, the unqualified. But these are the unqualified people that God chose and he used to do unbelievable and uncommon things to advance God's purposes. And, and the reason why we're studying this, 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 this message series on God's unheroes is not to glamorize these men and women. The, the goal here, really, and I want you to get this, I want you to see yourself in these stories. That's why we're studying them. I want you to see yourself, if not exactly like I am Gideon, or I am Rahab, or I am Moses, but maybe there's a piece of you or a piece of them in you. See, I did a series years and years ago here at this church. You can see the, the, the poster on the back wall said, I am Jonah. And you study the book of Jonah and you start to see yourself in that person. The, the one who God calls and you're stubborn and you won't do it and you run the other direction. And maybe that's you. And this is kind of similar. Maybe you're like Moses. Who am I? Maybe you're like Rahab. Like, who am I? Like, I'm, I'm filthy, I'm dirty, I've done such awful things, not only in the past, but even maybe in the present, that I, how could I be used to, to pursue and, and push righteousness to the world when I'm so filthy? God used her. And what about Gideon? 
in Sydney. My family's weak, and I'm the weakest of the weak. I can't do anything. Nothing I've ever done has worked. I can't, so I just give up, and I play defense, and I hide in a cave just to soften the blow of you, absolute loss. You know you're going to lose, but you just want to have damage control. Maybe that's you. I want you to see yourself in these stories because the upward call of God to, to build his kingdom to, to make disciples of all people, to be his witnesses to the ends of the earth is big and hard, massive, and you are small and weak, and we get that. But here's the deal. I see God, and you can see God in all these studies so far these last three weeks. You can see God. He uses the weak. He uses the lowly. He uses the little to actually do all this great stuff. And I don't know about you, but that gives me hope because I'm a reject, I'm a loser, right? I barely graduated high school. I was a drunk, a drug pusher, a porn salesman, car salesman. I'm a loser. I've never amounted to anything, but yet God can use me. It gives me hope when I study God's character, when I study God's calling, when I realize that it's not up to me, that I can't qualify myself. That gives me hope, right? And it's not because I'm awesome that God chose me. And it's not, <laughs> that's a bad place for an amen, but thank you. I know what you mean. <laughs> there's, there's certain things you can count on Michael for. That's one of them. <clears throat> but it's not that I'm awesome in any way. But it's actually kind of cool. Like the more unlikely the Bible hero, the better. Because none of us, I know you all now, no one in here thinks they're totally cool. No one. No one thinks they're awesome in this room. If anything, our scale would be tipped the opposite direction and say, we're not that awesome. How could I be used by God to do his great work? And the more unlikely you are to serve and be called, the better it is. Okay? And so today, I want to do like we have the last three weeks. I want to look at some Bible heroes. Some unlikely heroes that we find, not only in the Bible, but we find them in Hebrews chapter 11, the, the faith hall of fame, with people like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Noah and Moses, right? Great men of God. These two men that we're going to talk about today, Samuel and David, these, we have to talk about both of them because their lives are so intertwined that you cannot talk about one without the other, okay? So, you in 1 Samuel chapter 3? Do you have a Bible in front of you? Okay, Awesome. So before we read that, let's just, let's just say this. Let's start with Samuel. Let's give you a little background on Samuel before we read. Okay, Samuel's mom, his, his mom's is this lady named Hannah. And Hannah wanted a baby, and she wasn't able to have a baby. And so she was praying, God, please, I want a baby, I want a baby, I want a baby. Right? And I get that. I've never had a baby. I don't know what it's like to want a baby. But I know that for some that struggle to have children, that's like a thing for a lady. Like, they want to have kids, right? And so if they can't have kids, that's a real struggle. I get all that. And so she prays and prays, and she says, God, if you give me a kid, I'll, I'll give him back to you. Anyone ever make that, those kind of prayers before, Lord? If you'll just deliver me from this, I'll never have another cigarette again. If you just do this, I'll never... Right? You fill in the blank. You've all done it, right? Don't leave me hanging. Right? We've all been pathetic, whimpering puddles on the floor. Please just get me out of this one, and I'll never... And then the next week, bam, you're right back at it, right? Well, so Hannah had that kind of prayer. And she's like, God, if you give me a kid, I'll give him back to you. So that's kind of admirable, right? Whatever we get from the Lord, any good and perfect gift comes from the Lord. And so you're just a steward, right? It's not yours. Like your kids, they're not yours, right? You didn't really make them. You were like passive recipients of that grace. And you got kids. They're his kids, right? And, we, and, and Hannah understood that. And so you know what happens? So, so when he, it says in the scriptures, and, and before we read, if you read before that, you'll see that when he was weaned, so whatever age he was when he stopped breastfeeding, and I'm not a mom, and I've never really kept track of all that, so I don't know, six months, one year, two years, three years, right? Generally, somewhere around there. They didn't have Similac back then. So you had, you had mom's Milk, that was all they had, right? So whatever age that was, it says when he was weaned, she took her, mom and dad take the kid and drop him off at the church. 
at the time it was a tabernacle. It was this mobile, this, this, this movable church like this, but it was movable. They, right? So anyway, so just think the church. Okay? So she, she drops him off to the church. She was a woman of integrity, a woman of character, a woman of her word. God, if you give me a kid, I'll give him back to you. And guess what she did? She did exactly that. She gives him back to God. And she drops him off at the church and says, there you go, God. I'm a woman of my word. That's awesome and cool, and we need to keep our word, amen? Right? But, 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 but listen, how do you think he feels? I, 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 was, I was not put up for adoption. So I'm speaking tenderly here because I don't know who has in this room. But if you've been dropped off by your parents, even with good intentions, here's a kid who's what, two, three years old? He doesn't know anything about God. He doesn't understand integrity and character and keeping my word. He's three. He just wants to watch the Flintstones. You know what I mean? Like, he knows nothing. He knows nothing of God. You know what he knows? Mom and dad don't want me. I got dropped off and left. Right? And, and here's the awesome thing. If you read the story in, in chapter 2, verse 19... It says that they visited him once a year. So, yeah, she, she kept her word. She honored God. Awesome, right? But how about him? Do you think he feels a little neglected? When he doesn't understand the high virtue of integrity and character as a two-year-old? And he gets dropped off at the church and left and visited by these people who love you once a year? That's the backdrop of the story of Samuel. And so now would be the time that I'd say, well, now let's read the story of Samuel, right? But I think after thinking about it, I would say that the proper perspective, the proper thinking really is to change the verbiage in that statement and say, now let's read the story of God and see how God included Samuel in it. Okay, and so it's really not about Samuel, just like it's not about Moses, Rahab, or Gideon, and that gives us hope because really this series is not about the people because none of them qualified themselves, but God. That's really what this is all about, but God. See, but God chooses these people God is the common denominator in all of their stories. He's the one who gives us hope. And he's the one who gives us purpose. And he's the one who gives us meaning in life. Okay? And so, with that in mind, let's take a look at 1 Samuel chapter 3. I'm going to start right at the beginning of the chapter. And I'm, going to, I'm not going to read all of it. I'm just going to read some down to about verse 10. And I'm going to jump over to 19. You there? Okay. So, meanwhile, the boy Samuel served the Lord. He got dropped off, right? So, meanwhile, the boy Samuel served the Lord by assisting Eli. He was the priest. Now, in those days, messages from the Lord were very rare, and visions were quite uncommon. One night, Eli, who was almost blind by now, had gone to bed. The lamp of God had not yet gone out. I've done some research on that. Um, opinions vary, but... Generally speaking, there were some candles that were lit in the evening, and they would burn all night. So before that candle went out, there's one candle that doesn't go out, the eternal light. That's the, the light that represents God's presence in the temple, and they would never let that go out. Hence the story of the Maccabees. You can look into that. But there's other lamps that would go out as the night burned on. The lamp would go out. The lamp of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was sleeping in the tabernacle, right? He's sleeping in the church near the ark of God. This is the ark, right? This is, the, you know what I'm talking about, the ark of God, the, 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 the Ten Commandments, Moses' staff, manna from heaven, golden angels on the top, the presence of God manifesting himself, boom, right there. And Samuel is actually sleeping right by that, okay? That's an awesome bed and breakfast. And so he's sleeping by the ark of God. Suddenly the Lord calls out, Samuel. Yes, Samuel replied. What is it? He got up and ran to Eli. Here I am. Did you call me? I didn't call you, Eli replied. 
Go back to bed. So he did. Then the Lord called out again, Samuel! Again Samuel got up and went to Eli. Here I am. Did you call me? I didn't call you, my son. Eli said, go back to bed. Samuel did not yet know the Lord because he had never had a message from the Lord before. So the Lord called a third time, and once more Samuel got up and went to Eli. Here I am. Did you call me? Then Eli realized it was the Lord who was calling the boy. So he said to Samuel, go and lie down again, and if someone calls again, say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. So Samuel went back to bed, and the Lord came and called as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel replied, speak, your servant is listening. Jump down to verse 19. As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him, and everything Samuel said proved to be reliable. And all Israel, from Dan in the north to Beersheba in the south, knew that Samuel was confirmed as a prophet of the Lord. Can I pause there for a second? This is what qualifies someone to be a prophet of the Lord. There's a lot of the Lord said, the Lord told me, the Lord said, the Lord told me. He's going around the world. Okay? A real prophet of God is one whose words come true. How many, how many percent of the time? 100, right? 100. This confirms. This is what it says. Proved to be reliable. Everything he said. And, and they knew that Samuel was confirmed as a prophet of the Lord. Okay? Not everyone's a prophet of God. I'm certainly not. I say things wrong. Right? I'm not a prophet. I would read to you a, a solid prophecy. But I'm not a prophet. Okay? So just be careful. Just a word of, of, of warning to the body of Christ. Not everyone who claims the title is. Okay? Everything they say must come true, or he's not to be feared. Verse 21, the Lord continued to appear at Shiloh and gave messages to Samuel there at the tabernacle, and Samuel's words went out to all the people of Israel. Okay, so I saw three things there in the text that would make Samuel unqualified. If you're a note taker, you can jot these things down. I encourage you to do that so you can check on what I'm saying after you leave here and make sure that the decisions of faith are based on your research in your Bible, okay? Not mine. I've done mine. You do yours. Here's three things that make Samuel unqualified. First and foremost, he was just a little boy. He was just a little boy. Jewish kid, right? So back then and even now, in the Jewish culture, and I grew up in this, and so I can, I can speak from experience, you are considered a boy until you're 13. When you're 13 years old, you have your bar mitzvah. You go to the temple, you go up to the, to the stage, the rabbi points to the Torah that he's opened up the scrolls, and I had to do this, and they point to, and you have to read a section of the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. And, and, and listen, it's at that point that you're considered a man. Exactly. See, we know different, don't we? And I'm not saying make, I'm not making fun of anybody else, but you look at yourself when you were 13 years old. Man? Not even a little. That's, it's even questionable right now. But, but, but at 13 years old, you were considered a man, okay? And so let me ask you this. How many... When, when, when we're thinking about the next voice for the Lord, how many of you guys are thinking about the kids in the back, right? That they're going to be the next voice, the prophet of God, the next powerful voice in the church of Jesus Christ to send the word of God, the, the gospel to the ends of the earth. The next person is going to be one of them kids back there, right? Well, that's kind of silly thinking. Like nobody really thinks that. But is it silly thinking? I don't know if it's really silly thinking. It's the way we think. But I don't know if it's really silly thinking. See, when God called Samuel by name to be his prophet, to be his mouthpiece to all of his people, he was like, how old? 10? 11? I, I, I know one thing. He wasn't 13 yet. 
He was just a little kid. So, so here's the deal. A couple weeks ago, we, we saw that, 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 that God called Moses from a, with a voice in a bush at 80. And here now we hear this same God, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, calling this boy Samuel as a voice in the night at what? 10? 11? 12? I don't know how old he was. Just a little kid. So listen, if you wonder if you're qualified to do something for God, if, I'll just say this. Here's your first qualifier. If you're between the ages of, say, 10 and 80, you qualify. Right? Because God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's not a matter of whether you qualified yourself. It's a matter of whether, what, God, what does God see as someone who's qualified? If you're 10 to 80, you're qualified. There's no age restriction on that. Okay? And so Samuel, right, Samuel was not some massive, high-thinking scholar. He wasn't some powerful military leader. He wasn't some successful billionaire businessman. He was just a little boy, right? That's who Samuel was. So not exactly the most qualified, at least the way we would see it. Here's the second thing, too, and this is not so much something that makes... Samuel unqualified, as it would say, um, nobody's qualified. You'll see it here. Um, God's word coming to someone, the calling, very unexpected, right? It's just not something that's happening. Look at the first verse. Meanwhile, the boy Samuel served the Lord by assisting Eli. Now in those days, messages from the Lord were very rare. And visions from the Lord were quite uncommon, right? You see it there in the text. So, so there were, it was not very common, not very usual for, for God, for, for, for people to hear something from, the God, from God, to be called into the ministry, to be called into the kingdom, to be used by him. Not very common at all. And some people would misinterpret that by saying, see, 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 God doesn't call people too often. I'm off the hook. But that's a bad interpretation. Here's a proper interpretation. I need you to help me with this, okay? You guys ready? That was then, and that was so weak. That was then, and this is now, okay? So in Acts chapter 2, verse 17, and you can turn there if you'd like. I want you to always see it in God's Word so you don't see it, think I'm messing with you. There, there's a word there. There's a, a, a couple of words there that are, that are from the prophet Joel. So, so a long time, before, like way back in the Old Testament, this prophet Joel who lived back then, and God did speak to prophets. Like there were prophets. I get that Joel's one of them. But, but, but it's true that, that the word of the Lord came privately, personal to people. It wasn't very common. I get all that. But Joel, as a prophet of God, was gifted by God with this, with this reality. He knew that, that things were going to change in the future. That it wasn't always going to be like this. It wasn't always going to be very unusual and uncommon for God to speak to people. That something in the future was going to change. And so Peter, Peter reminds us of that reality in Acts chapter 2. And I want to read that with you. Acts chapter 2. So, so the, 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 the Holy Spirit has dropped and and the church is first starting, and the people are, are hearing from God, and they're speaking for God, and, and they're speaking in tongues, and everyone's freaking out. And, and, and so Peter reminds the people, hey, listen, 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 listen. This is not uncommon. This is what's supposed to happen. And so he says this. He, 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 he says, no, no, no. What you see happening here was predicted long ago, verse 16, by the prophet Joel. He says, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. And your old men will dream dreams. In those days, I will pour out my spirit even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. What was uncommon then is very common now. The possibility of God speaking to you and calling your name is very great, actually, because that's what God said he was going to do. <clears throat> so, uh, listen, I'm expecting him, as your pastor, I'm telling you, I'm expecting God to call you by name. 
I'm expecting your phone call to me telling me about how God called you by name. I, I believe even right now through my, even my voice that the Spirit of God is calling you by name. That maybe you were on the fence. I, I was part of a, a group of people that believed something, but now I want to be a person in that group that believes it so strongly that I'm actually going to do something about it. That's what I believe. I believe that he's doing that. And so listen, Samuel had some strikes against him. God didn't seem to be talking back then. So it was a very unexpected reality. And he was just a boy. No one would expect, including him, that God, look, look, at it, look what his response was. Did he think that it was God calling him? No, he ran to his boss, right? Hey, Eli, what? He didn't expect God to be calling. And some of us don't expect God to call you either. He was very unqualified, or so it seemed, but God called him anyway. Here's the third thing we see about Samuel. And, and I'm sure you can see yourself in this. If not, some of you, probably all of you. He grew up in church, but he didn't know God from a hole in the wall. Right? As, some of us go to church. We went to church our whole lives growing up because uh, mom and dad said so. Right? Samuel had no choice. He went to church because mom dropped him off at the curb and said, go. You're never coming home. Tough. If you don't like it, too bad. She dropped him off at the church. And some of us have kind of been dragged to church their whole life. And some of you might even be sitting here right now. And you've been, you've been in church and church, just like he saw religious activity. He saw, I hope, in a place like the church that he'd see high moral character. I would hope he'd see purity. I would hope he would see holiness. He saw all the religious activity, but he didn't know God at all. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 7. Go back to 1 Samuel. Verse 7. Samuel did not yet know the Lord because he had never had a message from the Lord before. You see? See, it, it, it hadn't become personal yet. You can know all about God. You can come to this place right here at 10837 U.S. Highway 441 in Leesburg, Florida. You can come here every weekend forever and see all kind of religious activity, but you might never know the Lord until it becomes personal. Like here with Samuel, you'll see it. He, he had been in the church, but he had never yet had a, a thing, his own thing with Jesus. Never. Some people have church-going folks, right? So they were dragged to church. But unfortunately, their thing is their mom and dad's thing. It's never become their thing. So do you know the Lord? That's the real question. Do you know the Lord? I'm not talking about knowing about him. I'm talking about do you know him? Do you, like now Samuel, do you now have personal one-on-one -on -one time with Jesus in prayer, in studying his word. Maybe he gives you dreams. Maybe he gives you visions. Personal. Just you and him. I want you to have that. And God wanted Samuel to have that. That's why he called him. But had he had that yet? No. And that's why God, it says that he came to him. God loves Samuel. And so he came to him and called him by name and called him into that relationship with him. And maybe that's you. Maybe that's, that's your word today. Maybe he's calling you by name to get off the fence and really get to know him. Can he call you when you don't know him? We see it, yes. Can he use you to build his kingdom when you yet not yet know him? Yes. And that's what he's doing here to Samuel. He's calling him in. Samuel was called to all-in ministry for God as a child with no resume that deserved such a call. And God came after him. And this kid became a prophet of almighty God to all of his people. That's amazing. Now, one of the most landmark things that God does through Samuel 
is to appoint, to anoint David as the next king of Israel. Anointing, that means marking him with the oil of God, blessing him, praying over him, pouring the oil over him, and that's what he does. So to find out that story, I want to ask you to go to, with me to 1 Samuel chapter 16. I want you to turn there, and let's read a little bit about this call, okay? Verse Samuel, 1 Samuel 16. So you're going to see that in the future that David, the little shepherd boy, actually does some incredible things, okay, with and for the Lord. God works through this guy like nobody's business. Probably the, the most powerful, awesome king there ever was. And God used this guy now. But before we get to all that stuff that he did, we've got to recognize who he was. Because that's the real story here. Remember, it's not about your qualifications. It's about who God calls, even with a lack of resume. Okay? So let's pick it up in verse 4. And Samuel uh, was told by the Lord to go find this guy, Jesse. He's got a bunch of boys, and I want you to go there, and I want you to anoint the one I tell you to be the king. Now, let me just tell you this. He goes. Now, before most people will do anything for the Lord, they want to know the result. Right? Well, how's this going to work out, God, before I go do it, right? I don't want to waste my time. I don't want to waste my money. I don't want to waste nothing. I want to know how it's going to work out before I go do this. I don't want to put myself out on a limb. What if I fail? What if I'm flawed? What if they don't listen? I get it, right? God told Abraham, pack up your stuff and start walking. Where? I'm not telling you. Just start. Then I'll tell you. And he did it. God told Samuel, go find Jesse. He's got a bunch of sons, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you which one to anoint. Which one is it before I get there? I don't want to look like a fool. I'll tell you when you get there. Just go. And what does he do? Verse 4. So Samuel did as the Lord instructed. I'm going to go back here for a second. I think it was last week that I told you that a lot of times things aren't going well in your life because of your disobedience to God. And when you're disobedient to God, he doesn't let things go well for you. Because he's trying to get you to a place of obedience, right? That's just his nature and character. That's what he does, right? And if you're disobedient, maybe that's why things aren't going so well. Maybe that's why things in your relationship with him and others aren't going so well because you're disobedient. God, why won't you do this for me? And he's like, why won't you do this for me? What's wrong with you? Why don't you listen to me? I'm the rock that doesn't move, not you. So Samuel obeys. He says, so Samuel did as the Lord instructed. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town came trembling to meet him. <laughs> What's wrong? I, love, so I always make fun of my wife. She's sitting right here, so I can make fun of her. Did you guys ever see that movie, The Croods? Did you ever see that movie? No. Anyone have kids? You got the movie, The Croods? These little caveman people, the dad thinks something's wrong all the time. Never not be afraid, he says. Never not be afraid. He always thinks something's wrong. Our kids call the house. You know, Meredith answers the phone because she's a little worried mama. What's wrong? Not hi, not how are you, what's wrong, right? <laughs> you're only calling me because you're, you're, you're in a massive car wreck, right? No. I, I love you. It just reminded me of her here because he comes to town and what do they say? What's wrong, right? Not what's right, what's wrong? Did you, do you come in peace? They're all worried, right? Yes, Samuel replied. I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Purify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. Then Samuel performed the purification rite for Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice too. When they arrived, Samuel took one look at Eliab and thought, well, surely this is the Lord's anointed, right? Big, strong, handsome, strapping young man, right? He's got to be the king. But the Lord says to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. I need to stop there for a second, too, because it's always good to learn something in church. There's, um, there's parts of the Bible that are really confusing, like Adam and Eve have kids, and one 
is loved. The other one's hated. Uh, was it um, Jacob and Esau? One's accepted, one's hated kind of a thing. Like, and then Jesus says you have to hate people. Like, okay, just, just understand this. We can't impose American ideals on biblical terms. Okay? We, we understand when he says this that he rejected him. Did he reject him? Like we, when we think reject, what do we think, right? we like, oh, this? Oh, no way. That's what we think. That's reject, right? You br- bring me something that you think is good. Uh, please. That's reject, right? That's what we think reject. Is that the way he thought of Eliab? There's no indication of that type of rejection. What he means is that that's just not the one he chose for this job. That's all. It's not that he doesn't love, right? For God so loved what? The world, right? He loves the world, like even the most awful, wretched human on earth that we would despise and want to put in jail for the rest of our life in a cave. He loves that person, right? So when it says he rejected him, that's not not like, oh, get out of my face. That's not it. I just didn't choose you for that job, okay? So just know that. Don't, he says, um, people judge, but okay, I have rejected him. The Lord, do, this is our verse. That's what we've been talking about all, all for the last three weeks. Here it is again. This is where we get it. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. Amen? People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So the story goes on, and I don't need to read the whole thing. The story goes on that each son after that, from the oldest Eliab on down, da, 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 they all get presented to Samuel because obviously the next best looking, the next strongest, the next fastest, the next buffed, the next guy, he's the one. He's the one. He's the one. Aren't we all stubborn like that? Right? We just keep insisting on the same standards, the same routine. We keep trying to, I think, who was it that said trying to do the same thing over and over again, getting a different response is insanity, right? That's what's going on here. It's just a model for us. That's exactly the way we are. They keep bringing the, they keep bringing the kids. I keep saying no. I keep bringing the kids. Right? He says, don't judge them like this. And so what do they do? Do they stop judging like this? No, they, do, they keep doing it. Guilty, right? All of us, raise your hand. Well, that's what we do. Tell me the Bible isn't for today. So, Samuel asks in verse 11, are these all the sons you have? To me, it sounds like he doesn't really know, like it's a legit question. He's not God. So God knows some things that we don't, but he's a man, and he says, is this all the sons you have? And, and so Jesse replies, well, no, there, there still is the youngest one, right? But he's out of the fields watching the sheep and goats. Samuel says, send for him at once. We will not sit down to eat until he arrives. So here you've got a, a room with a, a, a full-grown man in Jesse, all of his big strapping sons. Uh, they want to eat, right? And Samuel says, listen, before you sit down and eat, we're going to get this thing done, right? Holds them off. That, that just shows you how pressing this issue is. He's holding off the cavemen from eating, until this thing gets done. And so, they, he, Samuel says, uh, send for him at once. We'll not sit down to eat until he arrives. So Jesse sends for him. And he was dark and handsome and with beautiful eyes. He was a pretty thing, right? And the Lord says, this is the one. Anoint him. So as David stood there among the, his brothers, Samuel took the flask of olive oil. He had brought and anointed David with the oil. And the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. Then Samuel returned to Ramah. I want to say this too, and that's just another teaching point. It doesn't happen all the time like this. But you know the Bible in the, in the New Testament says to be being filled with the Holy Spirit? Like, be filled, be filled, because sometimes you're not. Can we just leave some room for always being filled? Yeah. Based on what we just read? That the, that the Spirit of God, it says that the Spirit of God came powerfully upon David from that day on. That he was, he lived filled with the Spirit, right? And so can we just say that maybe there's a possibility that you could live that way too? That maybe, just maybe, not based on who you are, 
but based on who God is, that he may come upon you powerfully and stay right there for the rest of your life, right? Could happen. It could happen. Okay. So, David goes on, as you probably know, to kill Goliath. This little shepherd boy goes out and faces the nine-footer, I think he was, right? Big, beefy Conan the Barbarian dude. And he goes out and he beats him in battle. And then David as king, and then back then the king was also like the general, right? The leader of the army. Him and his army go on to defeat the Amalekites, the Philistines, the Moabites, the Edomites, the Ammonites. They push back all these enemies so they could have the promised land. If you read in the Bible, it says that he was instrumental in bringing the Ark of the Covenant back to the people of Israel. He wrote 73 of the Psalms that we have in our Bible. He's the one who gathered all the supplies, the gold, the silver, the bronze, the fancy cloths, the gems, for for, for his son Solomon to build the temple of God. David did all that. And David, not only anointed, but actually becomes the king of Israel for 40 years. And David, even to this day, well, look, it's 2020, we're studying his life. And how many people in here regularly return back to the Psalms for comfort and strength? Come on, right? Even to this day, massive global impact through generations from this person. But as we can see in the text, he was a very unlikely candidate for all of this. Just like Samuel he was young, not, maybe not Samuel young, but experts believe that when he was out there in the field that day and Samuel had him called in, he was like 14 or 15 years old. And so from a normal perspective, the way we would think here in this room, generally speaking, he was the least qualified of the seven boys. See, when we think about rough and tough leaders... When we think of rough and tough leaders are going to be called to fight Goliaths and lead armies, who do we think of? We think of guys like this, right? What's his name? What is it, William Wallace? The, the Braveheart guy, rough. Go kill some people and drink their... I was, no, I can't go there. So, stop, 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 stop. Not that movie. I was actually thinking of Penguins of Madagascar. That's how bad I am. So the guy, I digress. So the, someone asked the, one of the penguins, where are they? He goes, we killed them and ate their livers. That, that's what this guy would probably say, right? You, you think about this guy to lead an army, or you think about the, the scorpion king, right? Big, bad, massive, tough guys that are going to conquer, right? When you think of people like that, when you think of tough guys that are going to fight Goliaths and lead armies, you think of men like that, not men like this. That's not exactly who you would think of, right? David was the, he was the littlest, the weakest, the the least experienced in life. But the Lord doesn't see things the way you see things. We look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart, right? We see things differently. You guys know who Warren Buffett is? Warren Buffett, some of you know who he is, some of you not. He's the third wealthiest man in this country. He has a, a, a worth of $81 billion, right? I can't even say it hardly. $81 billion. So when I tell you that he lives in this house, here, show me. When I tell you this, you're like, yeah, of course, I get that. We're not living in that house, right? Nobody's making that kind of money. You understand that he lives in this house, that he does. He would live in a house like this, not in, not in this, next, right? That's a nice house, right? We might live in that house, but not Warren Buffett, right? Wrong. See, that 3,100 square foot, that's a third of the size of your church. That's where that man lives. He bought that thing in the 50s for 25 grand. And he, he was interviewed. I watched him. He said, yeah, I could buy any house on the planet. That's pretty awesome, right? But I like this one. In Omaha, Nebraska, 3,100 square feet. That's double the size. I mean, you got, some of you have been to my house. It's, it's a nice little place, right? It's twice the size of my little house. The third wealthiest man in the country, $81 billion, lives in that house. 
We, 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 we can't judge a book by its cover. Just because, right? Just because he's got a bunch of money. That doesn't mean, how many people honestly, when I put that picture up, be honest in church, how many people honestly believe that when that first picture came up with the, that White House with the pool and everything, who thought that that was Warren Buffett's house? See? At least half the people in the room, right? Because we're programmed that way. That's what I'm saying. We are programmed to think this. He's got $81 billion, so that must be his house. Truth be known, that's Tiger's house. Now, he's worth $800 million. That's a crazy amount of money. I get it. But it doesn't even come close, right? That's a pauper compared to Warren Buffett. He's worth $81 billion, and he lives in that house. And he eats McDonald's every day. It's crazy, right? So we need to rethink the standards that we establish for God on who he can call and who he could use. As a matter of fact, I would take it to the next level. I would say that we need to rethink our prideful belief that we, that we even have the right to establish standards for God. Paul himself, right? Paul, the apostle Paul, who was sucked up to the third heaven, said, who can understand the thoughts of God? That's Romans 11. Right? Who can understand the thoughts of God? So here's what we see. When we see David, we see someone who's too young, who's too little, who has no experience. He's just a little shepherd boy. 1 Samuel 17, 33, he's about to fight Goliath. Don't be ridiculous, he's told. You're just a boy, and Goliath is a man of war. So what we see is just this little shepherd who's unqualified. But let me tell you what God sees. The same thing. A little shepherd. But you know what he sees, what we don't see is a little shepherd is someone who will faithfully care for his flock. What he sees is a little shepherd who will faithfully provide for his flock. Who will faithfully protect the flock. So that's what God sees when he sees the little unqualified shepherd boy. What he also sees is humility. Look at 1 Samuel 17, 45 and 46. He's going after Goliath, right? Instead of saying, look at me, I can do this, I can do this, I'm going to knock you dead, I'm going to whoop you, right? He says, you come with me with a sword, spear, and the javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you defy today, not I. He doesn't say, I'm going to kick your butt. He says, today the Lord will conquer you, and I will kill you and cut off your head. And then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. Right? Who does he give credit for? He gives it to the Lord, right? He sees a, a, little, a little shepherd who is faithful to protect and provide and care for his, his flock. A, a shepherd who's humble. And then here's the third thing. David had just the right heart. He didn't have the right appearance, obviously. He was a little shepherd boy, a little wimp, a little nothing boy, right? But he had the right heart. We look at the outside, and God's looking at the inside. And 1 Samuel 13, 4, that, what you'll see there is reiterated in Acts chapter 13 by the Apostle Paul. And he reminds us, even to this day, that God removed Saul and replaced him with David, a man about whom God said, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I ask him to do. That's who he wanted, right? He, didn't, he, he doesn't want someone who's going to be in stubborn rebellion against him. He wants someone who will do as he says. God saw this in David, a humble shepherd who would fearlessly and humbly care for his flock in willful obedience to God. Listen, no matter what kind of negative thing you can call about someone, they're ugly and stupid and, 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 and not prepared and uneducated and all that stuff, but that ugly, stupid, worthless guy who's walking in obedience is more of a threat to Satan than some GQ, buffed, good-looking, muscular, awesome, successful man who's walking in disobedience. Okay? So there's some truth to that. We walk in obedience to God. He says, go make disciples of all people. Go be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. Go, go build my kingdom. 
Go push back darkness. Be my ambassador. Let me make my plea through you to a lost and hurting world. And you say, who am I? Who who am I to do this? Well, Moses was a fugitive felon, a shepherd. And Rahab was a prostitute. And Gideon was a scaredy cat, little lowly boy from a people that never amounted to anything. And Samuel and David, they're just little kids with no resume. But there's something that Moses, Gideon, Samuel, and David all had in common. And this one thing made them powerful even though their resumes were weak. The scriptures say that of all four of them, that the Lord was with them. That the Lord was upon them. That the Lord possessed them. That's what made them powerful, right? And if you've repented of your sin and turned to God and embraced Jesus Christ by faith as Lord and Savior, then the, truth, the same can be said for you, right? That, that, that when you believed, he gave you his spirit. And so, so, so listen, that's what makes you powerful, right? Not because of anything that you are, but because of the spirit that lives in you. The spirit that raised Christ from the dead now lives in you. God is with you. Now go face your Goliaths. Go face your Pharaohs, right? Go, go make disciples of all nations, right? Go care for God's flock. You, you, all of you. The ones who are not qualified. I believe he's calling. He's pour, Because of what God says, he is pouring out his spirit on his whole church. So open your ears and listen for his voice. God is speaking. God is calling. And I, 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 I plead with you to open up your ears and listen. Could God be calling you? Could he be calling you right now, right here through my voice? Is it time to stop being part of a group of people that believe something, but but be a person in that group that believes so strongly that they do something about it? Is it, are you, is he calling you by name to full, this is going to floor you, full-time pastoral ministry? Could it be you that he's calling by name right now to shepherd his people? to love them, to feed them the word of God, to protect them, to pray for them, to disciple them? Is he calling you by name right now? Is he calling you to to worship ministry? Has he given you a gift instrumentally? Has he given you a a set of pipes that that makes you sing and would help others to ascend the mountain of the Lord and you've been sitting on that gift doing absolutely nothing with it? Is he calling you to do that? Is he calling you to children's ministry, to to, to be the voice of God to those kids back there, that maybe God wants to call one of them to great purpose. And he would do that through you, teaching and loving those children. Could it be that? Is he calling you to open up your home, as many did in the book of Acts? You see, they met in homes to study the scriptures together to talk about what is taught here on the weekend, to fellowship in, in, over those matters and figure out what are we supposed to be doing as a family of God to reach the unsaved, to reach the unchurched. Is he calling you by name right now? Is he calling you to the mission field? We don't talk about this a lot in this church, but is he calling you to the mission field? Is, did you hear your name called to go reach un? reached people groups across the world? Is he calling you to go lead the charge or to be part of the charge to dig wells in drought-laden countries that they will starve if you don't go? Is he calling you to that? Or is he just calling you to boldly share the gospel with people that you work with, your family, your friends, Your neighbors, is he calling you by name? So as as, as we're coming to a a close here in this part of our morning, I need to shut up and, and let him call. It was in the quiet of the night 
that God called Samuel by name. And, and I believe from what I can see in Scripture that Moses is up on the mountain of God. And all of a sudden, in the quiet, Moses, Moses, he called them by name. God's word is, is intended to bust up the rock. And so I'm believing right now in faith that his word has done just that. Busted up the rock of your heart. Killed disobedience. Brushed rebellion out of the house. And prepared you to hear his voice now. God, we're listening. head still down, still praying. I'm going to ask you a question, but I don't want you to stop praying. If you feel as though that God has either spoken to you through his word this morning personally, or you felt in prayer or whatever that you felt like he was talking to you this morning personally, just put your hand up real quick. So for those that felt like God spoke to him through his word or personally in prayer, I just want to encourage you. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. James said, don't just be hearers, but be doers, lest you deceive yourself. So take another moment and pray for his spirit to fill you in such a way that you can be bold to follow that prompting that you just got because everything in the world will fight against that. Everything will war against that. The enemy does not want you actively pursuing the kingdom, advancing the kingdom. He does not. And so fear and worry and doubt and every excuse in the world's coming at you right now as to why you should not respond to that prompting. Ask God to help you with that. He is your... He is your strength and your shield, the lifter of your head. He's an ever-present help in time of trouble. He will fight your battles for you, but you've got to ask him to. So please do that now. those who did not raise their hand to go back and reread the scriptures 
that maybe I'm not the messenger that was effective in communicating these truths to you. And maybe just maybe you just don't need to be listening to me this morning, but let the Holy Spirit speak to you personally in your one-on-one time in 1 Samuel 3 and 16. Let the Lord speak to you, okay? At this time, we're going to ask the folks who would come forward and grab the offering baskets. I would ask that they do that now. And I would once again encourage you to pray and consider what giving looks like for you in your church and being part of his effort to reconcile a lost and hurting world back to himself. The church is the only plan. We are called to be the city on the hill, the light of the world, the salt of the earth. We're the pillar and foundation of the truth, and he's called you here to this church to be a part of his, his saving mission. And so giving is part of that. I ask you to pray about that and ask him, what does giving look like for you? And then I would, in just a moment, the guys will go through the room and you can give according to the prompting of the Holy Spirit inside of you. If you want to give in the basket, you can. If you want to give in the box on the back wall, you can. Or there's online, there's a little giving kiosk in the front lobby in, uh, underneath the, the big screen TV. So, Father, we would ask you uh, to just lead us in the way that we should go. Uh, help us to, to be generous. Help us to show our thanksgiving. Help us to partner with you generously in advancing your kingdom in our community. And so please speak to us personally as to how we should give in this, in, on this day.